Hello, my name is Dr. Ariel Weigant, and I am an adjunct professor at Columbia College Chicago, as well as an instructional designer at Everspring Partners, which is a consulting firm that works with a variety of American universities to create compelling and engaging online courses for students in a variety of different degree fields. Part of my job is to make online learning engaging and accessible to the variety of students that will come through the courses that we build. And something that I noticed not only in higher education, but as many students went online during the pandemic, was that there were a lot of issues with connection, data limits, and just a general reliability of internet for K through 12 students. And I think it's important that as we perform online learning as we are instructors within this space that we take into consideration what I consider more non-traditional accessibility issues. Accessibility means that we often think about are those students who may be hard of hearing or have limited vision, but we should also be considering those students who may not have the ability to successfully access an online course. I'm sure since we, since many of us have been online for the past year in a variety of different aspects, I know for myself, my job as an instructional designer has been entirely online since March. And I have been teaching remotely since I began teaching at Columbia last fall. And we've all had this instance where there's a lag in our connection and all of a sudden we are unable to have a conversation because it's breaking up or our video is pausing, anything like that. And so we've all had these connection issues. And I think it's something we need to address in both synchronous and asynchronous learning. So previously, online learning for K through 12 students or university students was an option for them. It wasn't required. It was something that they could engage in if they so desired. However, as we all know, when the coronavirus pandemic began, many students were transitioned to an online platform in very limited amount of time. This caused a lot of hiccups. As they say, students maybe didn't have the right uh, technology like laptops or iPads. Maybe they didn't have a reliable internet connection. Perhaps they only had mobile internet versus like a data router at home, like cable. So we certainly saw this digital divide of students who had all of these preparations in installed already. For myself, I had a laptop, a decent internet connection, and the ability to transition from a workplace environment to a work at home environment. But that's not necessarily true for everyone, and we shouldn't assume that all of our students can do this. And so this sudden shift into online learning brought out very, very obviously the digital divide of students. It's been in anything from academic papers to the New York Times to general frustration from parents. And as online learning becomes a normal part of education, we need to take into consideration the accessibility factors of reliable internet, technology, and providing students with the ability to learn even if they aren't able to have high-speed internet or a laptop. The concept of the digital divide refers to the growing gap between the underprivileged members of society who do not have access to computers or the internet and those who do. The underprivileged is typically the poor, rural, elderly, and handicapped. If any of you have been to a smaller town and opened up your phone and found that you have one bar of service, you've probably encountered how limiting a rural part of America can be when it comes to internet connectivity. The privileged are typically the wealthy, the middle class, and those living in urban and suburban areas who have easy access. I know for myself, 
you know, pre-pandemic, I could easily walk down to a coffee shop within blocks of my home and have internet if it somehow went out in my home. That's not necessarily the case for some people, and especially not during the early months of the pandemic when everything was closed and there wasn't that space. So we certainly need to think about students who may not have the access necessary to join a Zoom call, which takes up a lot of bandwidth, or accessing large files, large images, things like that. So internet accessibility, as I've mentioned, is unreliable internet. That can be a very slow connection. That can be internet that goes in and out frequently. That can also be a mobile phone. So I was reading a New York Times article recently about a family in Mississippi where the son only was able to access his online classes through his mom's mobile phone. And she worked nights, so when she returned home, which would be mid-morning or so, then her son could get on the internet. But that also meant that he missed several hours of classes. So that's also how we would categorize unreliable internet. And then of course there's low bandwidth, which is the amount of data that can be accessed every second. So if you've ever seen an advertisement for internet service and they're like 100 megabyte connection speed, which is very fast, that means you can download things very quickly. However, that's not an option for everyone, especially if you don't live in an area that offers those high speeds. So we need to keep that into consideration because if you're using a lot of YouTube videos, students may not be able to watch them uh, in one go. They may have to wait for them to process and download a little bit. And with the way the YouTube system is, it doesn't download the whole video. It downloads segments of it right? that's, that's streaming. So we need to think about methods that allow students to easily access things without having to worry about a high bandwidth in order to do so. And lastly, data limits. If you've ever had a cell phone with a data limit plan, you know that you have to be careful about how much you access the internet or download. So if we're having students download a file that is multiple, multiple megabytes and we've got multiple files like that, that can eat into a data plan, especially if those students are using internet via a tethering system off a mobile phone. That can really hinder how much they can download. So keeping file sizes low can also help with data limits that students may run into. I know here in Chicago, when the Chicago Public Schools went online last spring, there were many issues with students not being able to get online. Thankfully, the city and CPS did try to get students laptops and iPads in order for them to access their classes so they could continue learning. However, it wasn't always successful. Sometimes students dropped off. You couldn't see how they were doing. It really did hinder learning, especially amongst younger children who are not as tech savvy as your high schoolers or your college students. So we certainly need to be thinking about how we can improve student experience in the online course space, especially as I hear that New York State has, is no longer doing snow days because they now have online learning. So we definitely need to think about how we can improve the student experience. So how should we do that? How do we make courses accessible to students? Well, we should be thinking about connectivity issues. I think there is an assumption, and I have definitely um, been guilty of this, of assuming that my students have reliable internet uh, because they go to a major institution here in Chicago. I assume they're all living in the dorms, which is not the case. Um, some of them are living at home and because they've decided not to live on campus during the, the pandemic, and they don't have as fast of internet as maybe they would if they were somewhere else. So I've certainly had to think about that myself and how that relates to my students as I'm teaching them. So we definitely need to be thinking about how to design our courses so we can take accessibility into consideration. I have four ways that I think 
are an easy implementation into online course spaces that can definitely improve student experience. If you're using an LMS like Canvas or Blackboard, keeping your image file sizes under 500 kilobytes reduces the length of time in which those images take to download. If you have a student who has a slow connection or low bandwidth or data limits, this can certainly help them. In regards to a slow connection, the images will be there more quickly. They don't have to worry as it slowly downloads on their page. And of course, downloading this information can cause a lag in learning if the image files take too long, and they may just skip over them and not even bother. They may never download if they're too big. If, if the connection speed is too slow, the internet will eventually just time out for that. So keeping them under 500 kilobytes can really ensure that students are able to see an image, especially if it is necessary for their learning. Keeping with the theme of images, I definitely recommend using alternative text for any images that are necessary to student learning. Not all images may be necessary. Sometimes we put images that we refer to as decoration in my job there to just provide some visual representation on the page that aren't necessarily needed for a student to understand a concept. However, if you have images like graphs or tables, anything that students need to look at and understand in order to comprehend concepts, I recommend using alternative text in case they aren't able to download those images. Some students may disable images because they want to limit how much bandwidth is used, how much data is used. And so providing two to three sentences to explain what that image is can make a huge difference. When using alternative text, you want to summarize the key concepts so students have that necessary course content information. Don't go too long, don't want to write an entire paragraph, but a few key takeaways that are needed in order for that student to understand what is being taught is important. Traditionally, I've added transcripts and slides to my courses for my students who are hard of hearing. This is an excellent way for them to still watch a video and understand the concepts that I'm talking about within these lectures. However, these also do double duty for students who may not be able to watch the videos because of slow video playback that's choppy or takes too long to load. By having the transcripts and slides, they can read through the lecture and review the slides in conjunction together so they're able to still learn the concepts that I'm discussing in class. Similarly, if you are teaching synchronously, turning on captions is great for students. While they aren't super reliable sometimes, they can be an asset for students, especially as review materials. So all around, including transcripts and slides, is a great benefit for students, regardless of the accessibility that they are facing. Lastly, allow opportunities for working offline. I think this is something I've struggled a little bit as I've transitioned to online teaching, is letting students work on their own outside of the online classroom. I have sat on Zoom calls with my students while they do work and Honestly, I don't see whether or not that is beneficial for them to sit there while we all just stare at a computer screen. Especially with Zoom fatigue being a huge issue, providing them opportunities to work offline, not on their computer, can be beneficial for their mental health and their education. So if you have downloadable activities or worksheets, maybe readings or review materials, that can be work that they can do outside the classroom. Now, of course, we have to trust our students that they do these things, and that can be difficult, and I know that I've run into that. But it's similar to students showing up to class every day prepared. If our students are invested in their education, we should let them be independent learners. Of course, make sure that you're providing ways in which to assess whether or not they are doing that work offline, but certainly for students who aren't able to be online for long periods of time because of accessibility 
issues with their internet, providing them with opportunities to download and take the time offline can really be beneficial for them. In conclusion, we should understand and be aware of student connection issues because this can improve learning. While we wanna make sure that we are providing our students with the necessary education, sometimes having online Zoom classes where you just talk for an hour or so doesn't necessarily help all students. If their connection is slow, it may be too choppy for them to understand. So having multiple ways of learning, whether that's through readings or activities, uh, videos they can access at a later time that include transcripts and slides can really help students to ensure that they're learning. Now, face-to-face -face classroom experiences are always going to be the better option, but we should be taking into consideration that sometimes students are going to have to be online and we should be improving their experience in order to ensure that their education doesn't suffer. Utilizing these best practices will make a significant impact on the student experience and their overall satisfaction in the course. If we are invested in their learning, both in the classroom and online, it will show in our students, but we need to take into consideration the limitations of online learning. And while I know many of us who have been teaching online this year are having to learn that very quickly and without much preparation, we should be thinking and reflecting on our teaching experiences over the last year in order to ensure that our students are getting the education. Ask yourself what worked well for your classroom online and maybe what wasn't as successful. How can you think, how can you use what you were successful with and continue with that and maybe even improve it? And how can you take what wasn't successful and are there ways that you can transition it to be more successful or perhaps remove it from your teaching practice? We just wanna think about how our students are learning best to ensure that they continue to learn. Online education is here to stay. As I mentioned, New York no longer has snow days and I'm sure many other states will do the same. Because of this, we need to ensure that online learning is a valuable resource to students not just something they have to do because they're unable to go into the classroom. We shouldn't be limiting students' learning because of the platform on which we are teaching. So thinking about ways we can improve their learning in order to ensure that they are having the educational experience that they should is how we can ensure that in the future, they don't have to wait while the page is loading. Thank you.